Episode 2 of Ruby Volume 7 is titled A New Approach, which is exactly what we heard Ironwood say in the Volume 7 trailer, so maybe it's about time that we learn what a new approach is? But before we get into that, I will say spoiler warning for those who have not seen Episode 2 of Ruby Volume 7, as I will not be showing the episode or any clips from it in this video, only images from the episode and offering analysis on the episode itself. I will leave a link down in the description below so you guys can go to the Rooster Teeth website, watch the episode there, and support the series that we all love. Now, this episode starts off with all of our protagonists stuffed into the back of a caravan on their way to what they can only presume to be prison. You know, for stealing an Atlas military airship, and invading Mantle, and using their weapons to defend themselves and the citizens. You know, some justified reasons, some questionable ones as to why they're being captured for. But, you know, we'll see how it all plays out. But they're not actually alone in the back of the caravan. There's one other guy there with them, presumably picked up after Team Ruby and everyone was captured. But this guy, we find out, is named Forrest. We only find out his name in the credits. He's not named in the actual episode. But considering he has a name, he might have some relevance to the volume overall. Now, this guy, upon hearing everyone talking about being captured by the Ace Operatives, he speaks up saying that the Ace Operatives are the elite of the elites of the military, that they are Ironwood's personal attack dogs. But they would never be able to capture Forrest, as uh, he is speaking out against Atlas's exploitation of Mantle, that he was captured because Ironwood wants to silence him and the movement that he's supporting. In reality, all Forrest did was throw a brick at the prison ship and got himself captured. I don't know why he thinks this is going to get people talking about the movement that he's supporting, but he seems just a little dumb. But this movement that he's supporting, he seems to be a real fan of their leaders, which is Robin Hill, as we saw in the background of episode one and also in the opening, but uh, Robin Hill and her happy huntresses. Now, I know it's a play on Robin Hood and his band of merry men, but Happy Huntresses just doesn't seem to have the right ring to it. You know, Hunters and Huntresses supposed to be fierce warriors, etc. But uh, I'm guessing this is actually what they're called. Let me know what you guys think about that name. It I kind of chuckled when I first heard it, but also it's going to be something that makes people underestimate them. Because, as Forrest explains, these were all top... Atlas graduates who could have joined the military but chose to stay in Mantle. So if you get on their bad side, make them get serious, they will easily be able to put up a hell of a fight. So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. And I want to see all of them fight, maybe against the Aesops. I don't know. It seems like there'd be a team of five against maybe a team of five or something like that. It would be an interesting fight. But Robin is aiming for a seat on the Atlas Council. And once she gets there, she plans to end Ironwood's tyranny. So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But then everyone arrives at Atlas, and we don't really get to hear more from that. But they're not headed right to the prison. No, they're being taken straight to Atlas Academy. And as everyone's getting off the ships, well, apparently we'll get to meet Ironwood pretty soon after all. Now, Forrest is in the background, and we don't see him at all for the rest of the episode, so I'm not exactly sure what happened to him. Guessing maybe the ship then took off and went to prison and tossed him in a cell. Now, Forrest... His, he has a connection to this movement, to Robin Hill. He's probably going to be the one who ends up introducing our protagonists to that movement, or to the leaders of it. That's my guess, at least, because we're probably going to see him again at some point, simply because he was a named character. Unlike the characters in Episode 1, who were just the drunks, they were just listed as the drunk guy, and I believe the drunk guy's friend. So, yeah, we'll see what ends up happening with him. Now, everyone is taken right into the Academy, and immediately we run into Ironwood, along with Penny and Winter Schnee. And uh, as everyone is kind of surprised at their reunion and everything, Nora's the one who points out the obvious, just like, uh, yeah, you want to help with the handcuffs? And uh, Winter then threatens the military soldiers that are escorting the prisoners. So you have 10 seconds to release them from their cuffs before I start hurting you. And Ironwood just stands there, kind of with a smile on his face, just, he's condoning this. Or at least he's not stopping it. That Winter is just threatening his soldiers to uncuff them. I mean, given the orders that they were, that the soldiers were given, that there was a ship that landed unauthorized, and it was an unauthorized ship that entered Atlas territory, you know, they were kind of under the right call to imprison them. 
though the unauthorized weapon use, etc., fighting Grimm, I don't necessarily agree with that, as I already mentioned, but still. And then everyone goes into Ironwood's office, and um, they say, we have some important things to tell you. And uh, it's Penny who speaks up. Is it about the relics? And then Winter says, or the Winter Maiden. So they've been filled in to everything. Not only Penny and Winter, but also the Ace operatives. Which kind of makes sense, considering that, um, well, as Ironwood explains, after Beacon Academy fell, he needed his own team of trusted individuals. Because Ozpin was gone, Glinda was staying at Beacon Academy, you know, Crow was elsewhere while well, taking care of Ruby and everyone like that. So yeah, he needed his own trusted group. And he apologizes for, you know, the way that everyone was treated, but um, they thought the ship was stolen. And Ruby kind of admits, uh, yeah, yeah, it was stolen. Winter is a bit PO'd by that and starts saying, you are friggin' reckless, what are you doing? And then we get to see Weiss hug Winter, the happy reunion. And I'm really happy they put that in and surprisingly Winter just forgives it. You know, you did what you had to do, I understand. Ironwood then pulls out the Relic of Knowledge from behind his desk and gives the speech that we heard in Volume 7 trailer, that until now he believed it was impossible to turn the tides against Salem, etc, etc, until she is destroyed. So it'll be interesting to see how Ironwood exactly plans to accomplish that, but upon revealing the Relic, that also prompts questions about the Relic of Creation. And we find out that the staff is locked away in the vault still, and we also get a little bit of information about the Winter Maiden. Winter is the one who says this, that the Winter Maiden is in stable condition. And Crow then points out that, you know, the Winter Maiden's not exactly a spring chicken. So Crow knows who the Winter Maiden is, and so does Winter Schnee. Although the Winter Maiden is not Winter Schnee, unless, of course, they are lying about it currently. But, you know, that will remain to be seen. But it does appear that Winter Schnee is not the Winter Maiden. I am still hoping, though, that Willow Schnee is the Winter Maiden, as in stable condition. She's not a spring chicken, which means she's not a young woman who would have just inherited the powers. So Weiss's mother, Willow Schnee, being a mother of three, not to mention uh, Winter is already, you know, 24? 25? I don't know exactly how old Winter is, but that would put um, Willow Schnee at least at like 45, 50 maybe. So not exactly a spring chicken, not Maria either, but um, still, and also stable condition. She has alcoholism, she has some mental problems it seems, so like with dealing with all the stress and everything like that. So. That theory is still possible, and it doesn't look like it's Robin Hill either, so it's either, in my mind, Willow Schnee or some other new person which we haven't met yet, which is entirely possible. Ironwood then points out that he may not seem like the most trustworthy person right now, you know, what with him recalling all of his military forces back to the Kingdom of Atlas and putting in place the dust embargo, you know, things that don't necessarily make people very happy. And, of course, that prompts questions as to why keep doing it then. His response is to which is so that Salem cannot infiltrate Atlas, and so that the military can be there to protect his people. Now, Ironwood, you can't be doing crap like that. He's referring to his people as only the Kingdom of Atlas, which consists of, as far as I know, the City of Atlas and the City of Mantle, and that's pretty much it. And he needs the entire military there to protect it. His people should be referring to all of Remnant, everyone that resides within it. Because a unified Remnant is going to be the best way to combat Salem, and also when the gods of, of light and darkness are resummoned to the world, if they get resummoned, which is probably likely in the Ruby series, it is the only way to avoid immediate obliteration, having everyone unified. Otherwise, they all die anyways. But this is something that he's going to have to learn throughout the course of this volume, once he learns the truth of the world, it was reunited with Ozpin, finds out everything that everyone learned in Volume 6, you know, etc. And we'll see how that plays out. But it's also pointed out to him that um, you're not exactly protecting them, everyone just hates you. Which is apparently a price he's willing to pay, as he has a new plan. After the fall of Beacon Academy and the destruction of the Central Communication Tower, he um, realized that the technology was a bit outdated. With the global communications down worldwide, you know, 
he decided to come up with a new plan utilizing Amity Coliseum. The scene that changed everything back in Volume 3 is back in Volume 7 now, and this time it's going to be utilized as a satellite. They're going to launch it into the atmosphere, and it's going to act as the central tower for global communication, so that even if another tower ends up being destroyed, communication will not be lost. A really good plan, but... Um, Upon seeing that it was going to be launched into the atmosphere, all I could think was that, oh great, just another thing for the God of Darkness to destroy when he comes back to the world. Because, you know, we saw how spiteful he was when he destroyed the moon. So, yeah, that, that's what I see happening to that, if, of course, Watts doesn't get to it first, and, um, you know, either implant viruses or hack it or something else. Because apparently it's going to need to take a little work for it to get more functional but we'll see exactly how that ends up happening. His overall plan is to reveal to the world of Salem's existence, and that's why he needs the military for step two of his plan. He's going to tell first all of Atlas that Salem exists, and he expects the panic, he expects Grimm to be drawn, and he expects all of the bad things to happen. And that's why the military is there, to protect his people. And then, after Atlas has calmed down and accepted the reality, and as he put it, accepted the fight against Salem, which is going to be interesting to see how that turns out, then he's going to use the global communication to tell all of Remnant. And apparently, as Winter put it, Atlas is prepared to protect everyone. Now, there's a big difference between protecting the kingdom of Atlas and protecting everyone else in all three other kingdoms. Atlas, is, again, as far as I know, is only the city of Atlas and the city of Mantle. Very concentrated. The other kingdoms are pretty spread out. Yes, there's the central cities, but there's other cities that are out there. I mean, Argus does have the military base, but, you know, there are cities close to the size of Argus that are probably out there in Remnant that aren't the capitals. The military, if it's needed to protect just central Atlas and they need all of that military, how the hell do they expect to protect everyone in all of Remnant? Yeah, that's not going to happen. His plan has a couple holes in it. Not to mention, Vacuo, most of the people, as we found out in After the Fall, are nomadic tribes. There consists of 100 to 200 people that are traveling around from place to place in the desert. If they find out all of this and start to panic and grim come, they're just screwed. Because I find it very unlikely that Atlas is going to send soldiers to each and every camp in Vacuo, not to mention each and every little settlement in Vale and in Mistral. So we'll see how this all turns out. I don't think it's going to go very well if the communication tower even gets up and running. Ironwood then goes on to say that hiding the truth of the world will eventually kill us all. But, you know, I feel like revealing the truth will at the very least kill everyone sooner because of all the panic and the grim, as I already mentioned. Oz had spent many lifetimes keeping this a secret, but now after Beacon Academy, Ironwood is only left with what he believes is best. And after he says this, he notices Oscar's a bit uneasy, and of course asks why. Crow points out that, well... This is the new Ozpin, and Ironwood, upon hearing that, has a genuine smile and runs over to Oscar saying, I'm so happy to see you again, Oz. The man just wants to see his old friends. He's been struggling for a while, it seems. But uh, unfortunately, it's pointed out that uh, Ozpin isn't really home right now, and before he gets an explanation, Ruby cuts in saying, we were in a train crash, and after the train crash, you know, Oz just wasn't present anymore. We don't know what happened. Ruby decided to lie to Ironwood. Not exactly sure why, and Ironwood knows that that's very curious, like that's never happened before. That's very strange. Did Ozpin say anything to you about the relic beforehand? And Ruby says, relic of knowledge has three questions, and unfortunately all of them have been used this century. So, Ironwood then goes on to say, well, yeah, that has been told to us as well, once upon a time. And then says to Oscar, well, hopefully, now that you're here, you are safe, and we can work together to bring Ozpin back. And at this point, something quite surprising happens. Ironwood actually picks up the relic, walks it over to Ruby, and hands it back to her. 
saying that, you know, after everything that happened with the Ace Operatives, I don't want you to have any reason to think that I'm hiding anything from you. And hands the relic back to Ruby. Now, with that, that means, for me, one of two things. One, Ironwood is genuinely, like, I want you guys on my side. I need this inner circle. I need your help with all of this. Please trust me. I'm showing you this good sign of faith. Or, Ironwood's already used the last question of the relic. That's a possibility, too. Now, as what did he ask for? Maybe it's something else to do with how to destroy Salem. Because at this point, and for the rest of the episode, we don't actually find out that part of his plan. We know that a new approach is his approach to opening up the truth of Salem to everyone in Remnant. But when he says, unless we destroy Salem, he has nothing to offer in that aspect. They said no way to how he plans to destroy her. So, um, yeah, I'm wondering if he used that last question from the Relic of Knowledge to find out how exactly to do that. We'll have to find out, because we know that Jin can be called even if there's no question to be asked. As Ruby found out at the end of Volume 6, though, Jin said, I will not answer again unless you have a question, so we'll see how that turns out. Either way, I hope we see Jin again. And he also offers everyone, you know, now that you're in Atlas, let's get your equipment up to our standards. Because they show a hologram of Blake as she's standing there with the broken gamble shroud, or just the nub of what was left of it, and uh, embarrasses her a little bit. So Winter says, as long as you're in Atlas, you will have the full capabilities of the Atlas technology. So everybody's getting some upgrades, which it's going to be really interesting to see. In the opening, we can see that Yang got an upgrade to her arm so that she can now fire what seems to be fireballs from fire dust. Jean also got hard light dust put into his shield, so that's going to be interesting to see, and we'll see how everyone else gets their weapons upgraded. But in the meantime, get a piece of gum, stick Gamble Shroud back together, and see how that goes. Everyone then leaves Ironwood's office after agreeing to help him with his plan. As for the first part of it, at least, it's a good plan. Restoring global communication. Yeah, very good. The second part, however, revealing the truth of Salem, mm, uh, not so much, but we'll see how that ends up going. Whether, you know, the satellite even takes off, because, you know, Watts is there and everything like that. So, with that, everyone leaves and encounters immediately the Ace Operatives who I'm genuinely looking forward to seeing more from, as they don't seem to be the arrogant military types or anything like that. They seem to be genuinely happy to be working with Team Ruby and everyone, saying that, you know, you guys have been fighting just as hard or harder than we have. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this all plays out. And we actually get to see all of their names in the credits, as they all had some line to say during this episode. Of course, we're first introduced to Clover, who we were introduced to back in the previous episode, episode one, as he was the only one to speak. And then we're introduced to Elm, who seems very eccentric, as, uh, you know, she really shakes Ruby's hand, and is also the hammer wielder, so there's a couple similarities there between her and Nora. Maybe there's a connection? So, we'll see if anything happens in that aspect. Then we get to Mero, who is a what appears to be a wolf faunist, based on his tail. He tries to play coy, saying that, you know, not that I'm too happy to work with you, but his tail's wagging vigorously, that he actually has to grab it to stop it from wagging, so... Yeah, he's happy to be working with some new people and seeing new strengths. Then we see Harriet, who, as, you know, the last member, Vine, put it, seems to be a bit competitive, as she's looking forward to seeing what everyone's capable of. Vine, he looks like a monk. Not really sure what else to go on, as he doesn't say anything else in the episode. So, we'll see what ends up happening with them. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Now, then Penny pops up and says, I'll give you a tour of the school. And after she leads everyone else off, this is when we see the most awkward hug I have seen in a while. Ironwood comes up and says, you know, Crow, I am really happy to see you again. And hugs Crow. And the look on that man's face is of just, I don't know what to do at this very moment. But he ends up returning the hug and it's... Like, Ironwood genuinely just wants to see his old friends. He wants to see some remnant of his past because, as I said, 
He'd been struggling for a while. Anyways, after that, we get a brief tour of the school where Penny's just showing them around here and there, but everyone's just exhausted. And Penny's saying, well, Atlas is the most funded school. Each team gets their own rooms. It'll be just like Beacon because you'll all be, you know, back in your dorms. And uh, then that's all we see of our protagonists. But what we do see is in Mantle. Watts is already there. And there may be a bit of a time skip here, but I don't think it's really that much. Watts is already in Mantle and he's communicating with Tyrion via, via like a Bluetooth or something. And he is able to control everything in Mantle. He says that, well, Atlas security has been beeped up for Atlas, but none of the code has been modified for Mantle. And Watts helped write the security code, hence why he could dismantle it so easily back for Volume 3. And we see he's able to manipulate everything with just the click of a button. He changes walk signals so that he can just walk across the street, causing chaos. He also brings up barricades to make another car just crash into it so it doesn't hit him. He's manipulating everything. And most importantly, he deactivates all the cameras around the city with one click of a button, it seems. And this allows Tyrion to start walking around. And um, he walks out of, a, out of a room, and as we see him walk out, there's blood trailing from that same room. So Tyrion just killed someone, possibly another news reporter or journalist trying to get information on someone, perhaps Robin Hill, that's at least my theory, and um, he starts walking away, and then we see on the cameras what I'm guessing is just the blood trailing out, though it could be something different. I don't really know what else it could be. Maybe a Geist Grim shadow on the ground, but I think it's just the blood and that's what it's meant to show. But uh, yeah, the episode ends off on that cheery note. So yeah, there's quite a bit that this episode is setting up for. Not the most action-packed, but very interesting nonetheless. Now, one thing I want to touch on that was mentioned in the conversation between Watts and Tyrion, Tyrion was very concerned about being seen and being recognized. And he specifically said, what if someone recognizes us? So that means Tyrion's recognizable in Atlas? I mean, of course, by Crow and Team Ranger, but anyone else? They're in Mantle right now, and I know the cameras would have feed to Atlas, but that's really interesting that he would say that. And Watts... I know he's a disgraced Atlesian scientist, but considering he was high enough up to write security code for Mantle, he was probably a very close ties with Pietro and Ironwood. And we're probably going to see Watts interact with Pietro at some point. I just hope he doesn't end up killing Pietro or anything like that. That man's old. That man's done a lot of good work. He needs to live the rest of his life in happiness. So... We'll see how that turns out. It's interesting if Tyrion is recognizable in Atlas by more than just a few people we have seen him encounter in the series so far. We'll see how that turns out. Now, we also got a hint at the Winter Maiden. It's not Winter Schnee. It's not Robin Hill. But it's someone who needs to be in, you know, stable condition, who's not a spring chicken anymore. I still think it's Willow Schnee, but it could be someone else who's been kept maybe in personal care or maybe in some padded cell somewhere because she's a danger to herself and others or something like that. There's something off about the Winter Maiden, and that kind of makes me think it's Willow Schnee well, with the alcoholism and everything, and she would be secure in the Schnee Manor. We haven't seen Jacques Schnee, so there's going to be that that needs to be touched on as well. I'm glad to see that Weiss didn't just get taken right to her father, that the military took them right to Ironwood, and winter, and everything like that. And that's one thing I'm actually very happy about seeing in this episode. I feel like a lot of people are going to point out that, oh, well, that's kind of bullshit that Team Ruby and everyone were captured immediately and then just taken right to Ironwood and get to meet with them and everything. There's no workaround. I'm glad that that's the case. That makes sense. The second that the military would get a hold of these people, and especially turn the weapons over to Ironwood, someone that Ironwood would want to interview personally because they invaded Mantle on a stolen ship, so Ironwood would want to know exactly what's going on, and then he'd find out that, oh, it's Team Ruby and everyone. Bring them right to me. I want to talk with them. It makes sense that they were just taken immediately there. But I feel like some people may have some criticisms. We'll see how everyone reacts to that. But 
again, let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Do you think they should have taken a little bit more time with that, or is you okay with them just going straight to Ironwood? I like getting the information right away. Now, everyone is going to be staying in the school dorms, so we're going to see more people from Atlas. I'm really hoping that we get to see the dude who made it to the finals in the Atlas, or in the Vacuo, or the Vital Fighting Festival, because he got no name, no words, but he has an interesting design, and I want to see that guy. I want to be introduced to him. I want to see his backstory, because he's a third year. He might actually be a member of the Happy Huntresses, now that I'm thinking about it. That could be something interesting to see. I want to see returning characters, as well as the rest of Team Funky. You know, Flint and Neon. I want to see them, and now that we're in the barracks at Atlas, we likely will. If, honestly, if Rooster Teeth doesn't show us Flint and Neon, that's going to be a real shame because we're going to get more school life for the next episode or two. At least a little bit of it here and there. Maybe Team Ruby will start attending a couple more classes. Maybe we'll meet a couple other professors. That would be very, very interesting to see. And hopefully we will. Then there's also the question as to what made Ruby want to lie to Ironwood? Honestly, he seemed very foregoing, very trusting with sharing all of the information, telling them that, you know, the staff of creation is safe, the Winter Maiden is safe, Crow knows who the Winter Maiden is, which is surprising, why hasn't he shared that information before, and all of this, but even giving the relic back to Ruby, Ruby didn't say any of the new information that she learned. I feel like she should have said, Oz did tell us one thing now that we've joined the fight against Salem. That, you know, Salem can't be destroyed. That that was one of the questions he asked to the Relic of Knowledge, and the Relic of Knowledge responded with, you can't destroy Salem. I feel like that would have been something very important for them to tell Ironwood so that maybe he would reconsider opening that information up to the public and also tell them what his plan was for destroying Salem. Which, as I said before, makes me think that he did use this last question of the relic as he seems to have a plan to destroy Salem. Maybe he found the right question to ask to get that information, or I don't exactly know. Again, we will find out, but um, it's really curious to think about. And I'm wondering if Ruby's gonna be curious about that last question being used as it seems really odd that he would just hand it over to a child. Yes, a child who's been protecting the relic for the past couple weeks, month, two months? How long has it been? I don't exactly know the entire timeline. I think it's been like a month or two since the fall of Haven Academy, considering everyone is now in Atlas as well as Tyrion and Watts. So we'll see what exactly the timeline is, hopefully. But, you know, it still kind of is odd that he just hand the relic back over if it has any questions left. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think that Ironwood is completely trustworthy? Do you think that Ruby shouldn't have lied about everything, or at least withheld all of that information? Not exactly sure. And also, what do you guys think about Ironwood's plan to open up that information to the entire public? That raises a more interesting question of, do you guys think that there is some information that the government has that just should not be available to the public? That, for example, there being this great evil called Salem that the government would need to hide from the public to avoid panic, which would draw the grim, which would endanger everyone. As I said, Vacuo's kind of screwed if everyone starts to panic. So... Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below as to um, how you think this is all going to turn out after the information we just got. It was nice to see Amity Coliseum again, and I really am looking forward to having communications restored across all of Remnant, as maybe we'll get Yang and Ruby contacting their father again and see how that turns out. That would be that would be really nice and have Ty reunite with Crow and everyone. You know, we'll see how that all turns out. And not to mention... Communication restored with Glinda, Ublek, and Professor Port. You know, seeing some returning characters would be nice. So, let me know what you guys think. 
in the comments below about everything that's happened in this episode and how you guys enjoyed this episode. I personally have liked every both episodes so far in Volume 7, but I'd really like to know what you guys think and discuss in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you have not already, and I'll see you guys in the next video.